Well, the French have long advocated a much more European orientated defense and an integration of European defense industries. And their principal complaint <laughs> has been that um, other Europeans, both in Eastern Europe and the Germans and the Dutch um, and the Italians have had a tendency to buy uh, American uh, military equipment rather than Europe concentrating on constructing European ones. I think that is going to change. So there is a, a very significant economic and industrial uh, interest uh, being built up for European rearmament. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today I'll be speaking with the chair of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, uh, about the implications for Europe of the recent remarks by Donald Trump uh, on NATO and uh, America's likely role in it if he becomes president. John, thank you for joining us. You were born in America and follow American politics closely. First question, I suppose, to ask is, how likely is it that Donald Trump will be elected president in November? Well, I think it is quite likely if he survives all these legal challenges, which uh, could, I think, still derail him. Because I think he represents something very powerful in America, which is the desire for isolation uh, and a sense of wishing to concentrate on domestic problems rather than international ones. Trump told a story, which may or may not be embroidered to his own advantage, about a discussion with uh, the president of a large, Amer a large European country um, who asked him whether the United States would be prepared to uh, observe its NATO obligations. And he said not necessarily if they don't um, pay 2% as he sees it. Um, what, um, what do you think was the point of that story? Who were the recipients of the message it was try trying to convey? Was it the American electorate or, or was it the European partners? No, I think it's the American electorate. I think he uh, is riding on a sense that America has been spending far too much of its resources uh, around the world internationally, and in particular helping a whole lot of people who uh, are not perceived to be uh, particularly sympathetic to uh, the United States, um, and that these resources should be devoted to addressing the problems of America. I mean, his electorate are those who have been left behind by the growth of globalization uh, and by the deindustrialization of America. And he is promising, uh, without any real coherence, uh, to reverse that process and to have uh, America first, as he, that's his main idea, America first, make America great again, concentrate on American domestic priorities, uh, not on uh, foreign policy. If he were elected president, would he be able to carry through that agenda? Uh, after all, Congress and particularly the Senate uh, has an important role in as guardian of America's treaty responsibilities. I think he would be able to carry it through because it does represent a very broad uh, perception uh, in American society. I mean, the principal barrier to uh, this pivot uh, would be the uh, interests related to the military and to the um, to the arms manufacturing uh, industries. But uh, he's not going to diminish American strength. Um, what he's going to do is to pursue a much more protectionist trade policy and seek to repatriate economic activity uh, to the United States and to its immediate area. I and mean, I think his vision of the world is one that has been prefigured by a number of characters in American foreign policy. I mean, I'm thinking particularly of General Petraeus, who made a, um, a very interesting speech a couple of years ago about how America should concentrate on the Western Hemisphere and that its interests both in Asia and in Europe and in Africa uh, were essentially peripheral. And although Trump is riding very much on the risk of immigration, to, the impact of immigration from South America, from uh, Central America, into uh, the United States and American identity that goes with that. His geostrategic vision is very much one of the Western Hemisphere with a periphery, uh, Japan, um, Taiwan, uh, Southeast Asian, uh, uh, Indonesia, um, as a, a bulwark against Asia and 
the question really is how he views Europe in that context. And my feeling is that he's not interested in the European Union, but he is, I think, probably still interested in the United Kingdom as a sort of outpost on the shore of the uh, Eurasian continent. Well, we, we can talk about that later, but let's stick to American politics for, for a moment. Um, uh, it's a year, or well, just under a year until the election. Um, do you think that there's a, a chance of uh, American politicians and American public opinion anyway becoming tired of supporting Ukraine? Is that a danger that you see? I think uh, the mood is clearly shifting. Uh, but whether this is dominated more by the greater priority that uh, the American media certainly give to the crisis in the Middle East and the Israeli intervention in Gaza um, over Ukraine. I mean, that is the dominant story. And there's no question that American public opinion is more interested in what is happening uh, with Israel than it is uh, over what is happening with Ukraine. Do you think that if there is a diminishing um, American interest in Ukraine throughout this year, and particularly if Trump is uh, is, is elected, um, do you think that Europe will be able to step up to fill the vacuum? And, and in particular, uh, will Germany be prepared to play, the, play this leading role? Yes, I do. I think there is uh, a very powerful head of steam now behind uh, European rearmament. And actually, particularly in Germany, not so much in the political sphere, which is um, still very uh, reluctant, I think, to see Germany uh, as a military player. But it is the industrial dimension that is going to prove decisive, I think. I mean, the German economy faces some enormous challenges from uh, the probable end of globalization, certainly as we've seen it in the last 30 years. Um, and therefore, the export-led strategy that it has had, the global export-led strategy that it, that it has had is now under severe strain. That increases the necessity of deepening the European home market for Germany. But also the technological transition uh, involved with climate change and the end, in particular, of um, the internal combustion engine in the automobile industry. And the, that is the key industry for Germany. And the shift to electric cars is going to mean a, a very large number of the Mittelstand companies that have been producing components for uh, combustion engine motor cars um, will no longer be required. And the question is, what are they going to be doing? And so uh, a shift to rearmament and into climate orientated technologies, that is going to be a very important part of German industrial strategy. So although the public debate in Germany is still defined to a degree by the past and by a reluctance to uh, consider a, 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 a much more military profile, um, the, the economic and industrial interests are driving it very powerfully in that direction. And there's no question that Europe uh, as a whole is more than capable economically, of matching um, the the gap that uh, any American withdrawal from European defence would do we, we Do we discern in, in France, in Italy, in Spain, a, a political commitment to, to that matching of the gap? The countries which are further east, as if you like, which are and which border Russia um, have got very substantial uh, defense budgets now and have had for some time. Um, but has that message filtered through to per places in, in Europe further west, further away from Russia? Well, the French have long advocated a much more European oriented defense and an integration of European defense industries. And their principal complaint <laughs> has been that um, other Europeans, both in Eastern Europe and the Germans and the Dutch, um, and the Italians have had a tendency to buy uh, American uh, military equipment rather than Europe, concentrating on constructing European ones. I think that is going to change. So there is a, a very significant economic and industrial uh, interest uh, being built up for European rearmament. But the other thing which um, is not spoken about a great deal, uh, certainly not in public, but is certainly underway, is discussions about uh, producing a serious European nuclear umbrella. And this is obviously being led by the French to a degree, but it is the fundamental problem that uh, 
the withdrawal of America from European defense is essentially about the nuclear umbrella. And the question is, is it possible for the Europeans to uh, meet, meet that gap? And nuclear weapons are politically very complicated, but uh, in terms of their uh, economic resources, they're, they're actually very cheap. And if that is the gap, um, then it is a political question, not an economic one, um, of whether this can be filled. And there are certainly negotiations underway to uh, Europeanize in some form the, the French independent deterrent. And where does the United Kingdom fit into all this, um, both objectively and subjectively, if you like? Uh, traditionally, it's been that the British view that defence issues should be um, uh, considered through the NATO forum. Um, but if NATO is going to be denatured, going to be hollowed out, where does that leave the United Kingdom? Well, that is not at all clear. I mean, the problem that the UK has is that um, having left the EU, in as much as European rearmament, so conventional rearmament we're talking about now, um, is going to be in an, a European Union context, the industrial cooperation and the funding for it that is going to be entailed in that. Um, there is a, a danger that the UK is uh, I- increasingly excluded from that. Already our uh, armament industry is very much orientated towards uh, the American uh, market in the sense that we are subcontractors for a large range of of American-led projects. And I think this divorce is likely to continue. And, and, and that, I think, it does pose a, a particular danger for European for, for British defence industries in participating in, in European defence. And uh, as regards nuclear cooperation, I, this was very much an issue of, of a long time ago, in 2010, when there was the Anglo-French Defence Treaty, consideration of a deeper nuclear uh, cooperation between um, uh, Britain and France, but in the debates that are going on at the moment on the continent towards a, a Europeanization of uh, the French nuclear deterrent, Britain is is excluded from that by the fact that our uh, nuclear deterrent is very much technologically dependent on the United States. It is not fully independent in the same way that uh, the French system is, and any plausible European system uh, that might replace that, uh, because that system would be designed to be precisely independent of the United States. So there's a possibility that that far from um, bringing the United Kingdom back into the European orbit, uh, a Trump presidency might accentuate the move towards the United States from the United Kingdom's perspective. Uh, is that a, a wise move by the United Kingdom? Will Trump provide, prove himself a, a more reliable ally, ally for the United Kingdom than he has been for anybody else in the past? Well, this comes back to what ultimate foreign policy conception the people around Trump, and that's more than he himself, um, actually are operating on. And I, I think it is this uh, notion of... Um, the American hemisphere as being the the, the homeland uh, for the United States, and that its interests in dealing with Asia and dealing with Europe are uh, to operate via peripheral players. In the case of, of Asia, Japan, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, uh, particularly, and in dealing with Europe, perhaps Britain. Um, the But behind this is also uh, a realization which I think leads Trump to have more support in uh, foreign policy um, theoretical circles than some people appreciate, that he is accepting that the the, the, uh, the former Western notion that uh, the whole world was going to become Western um, has gone, and that it is necessary to live with China, to live with Russia, which is increasingly a... a an instrument of China to live with India, to live with the Middle East, uh, the, the, um, the 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 Islamic world, to not try and alter them and and make them Western in some sense, and that I think is is the vision that is driving what lies behind a lot of the Trump rhetoric, and and which will survive undoubtedly whatever happens so in in the American elections. I think this this isolationism this new perception of a, of a world that is no longer going to be entirely Americanized, but it's one in which America has to remain strong, but detached 
Um, I think that vision is going to survive really whatever happens in the American presidential elections. Some prominent conservatives um, have recently been quoted as saying that they would favor um, uh, a win for Trump in the presidential elections. Um, do you think that that's a, a view that's widespread and going to be widely publicized in the Conservative Party over the next few months? Or would it be electorally advantage advantageous to the Conservative Party to, to strike such a posture? Well, it's certainly true that um, those who wish to get rid of Sunak ahead of the uh, UK general election, uh, some of them are toying with the idea of giving Farage a much greater role, um, bringing him on board, um, and thereby uh, preventing uh, reform running against the Conservatives. And the key argument for that is precisely Farage's very close personal relationship with Trump. And the idea that he, playing a prominent part in a campaign, um, would uh, open up the prospect of the, a special relationship being relaunched with the United States, including, above all, the, the, the much vaunted trade deal with America, which is a crucial pillar but of Trump the economic argument for Brexit. Trump is very unpopular in the United Kingdom. If the Conservative Party is seen as being identified with him, surely that will be electorally disadvantageous to the Conservatives. I think it could well be, but I, I think there are uh, this notion of particularly the Farage personal relationship with Trump is certainly a factor at the moment in the plotting against Sunak. And it's also, I think, a factor in the timing of the general election. I think there are Conservatives who who believe that a, a mid-November general election in the UK after the American elections, on the basis that Trump wins, would actually be advantageous. Now, but of course, you're right that in the broader picture, um, Trump is an extremely unattractive figure for a large number of people in, in the UK. And this highlights a, a, a very deep divide that, that Brexit has opened up. I mean, Britain's relationships with Europe have always been torn between whether we are closer to the Americans or closer to the Europeans. And, and that divide is very profound. And Trump, uh, a Trump presidency would undoubtedly exacerbate that divide. Um, even with a Labour government, um, perhaps particularly with a Labour government. But what would be the attitude, do you think, uh, of a Labour government coming in in, in late November um, towards a Trump presidency? Well, I think the... Um, Would it be Tony Blair, Mark II? Well, the influence of, of Tony Blair is obviously very large over Starmer and his team. Um, and, of course, Blair played a very significant part in preparing the ground for Brexit precisely by his uh, determination to go with the Americans rather than the majority of European opinion over Iraq. And I think that it is highly likely that initially... Um, the Labour Party under Starmer um, coming into government would seek to um, to accommodate itself with a Trump presidency, perhaps even in the hope of, of developing a, um, a special relationship along the lines that the Conservatives might be offering um, without Farage. Um, but the whether this would actually last is quite a different matter. Final question. Uh... <laughs> There was a lot of talk, there has been a lot of talk, particularly from Macron, about strategic autonomy for the European Union. Um, that question of strategic autonomy will pose itself in a particularly acute form uh, if Trump becomes president. Um, do you think that uh, Europe is nearer today or further away from strategic autonomy than it was two or three years ago? Is it a realistic prospect that Europe could strike out on its own uh, to make a, a meaningful go of strategic economy, autonomy uh, in face of a Trump presidency? Oh, I think certainly, yes. Um, I, I think that uh, the combination of the Ukraine crisis and uh, a Trump presidency um, will mark a very significant step forward in European integration. And the, the Germans sometimes compare, um, German historians sometimes compare the process going on in Europe at the moment to the uh, unification of Germany in the 19th century, the sense of a growing uh, European identity. Uh, and of course, one factor in what drove a German unification was the perceived threat of Russia by 
the Prussian state. Um, and I think, in a sense, history might be repeating itself, that uh, there is now unquestionably a, a growing sense of a shared European interest uh, at a popular level across Europe. Uh, it, it takes some um, harsh uh, um, manifestations I mean, in the greater sense of uh, concerns about immigration and European identity and the rest. But in the in the defense field and in the desire for uh, strategic autonomy, I think its its impact is very clear. So I, I do believe that uh, uh, this combination of the the threat of of Russia and uh, a Trump presidency will create a much closer European Union. Well, that uh, be a, an uh, ironic, um, but but perhaps not not negative um, outcome uh, of a, a, a Trump presidency. Um, thank you very much, John. You've given us much, much food for thought. Um, thank you to those who've watched us. Um, there are many such um, similar discussions uh, on the Federal Trust website, uh, which I hope our viewers will look at and find of interest. Thank you very much and goodbye.